don't bite. Uh, you want to sit all the way back there. Can you hear me? So we have been looking at the book of Jonah. Uh, we have gone through a character study of the book of Jonah. The first session we looked at the non-human creatures in the book of Jonah. Can anyone name a non-human creature in the book of Jonah? The big fish or the whale or the leviathan like monster, sea monster. What are the, another non-human creature in the book of Jonah? Say again. Cow. The cows. The wind, the storm. The bush. The, tree, the bush, yeah, the tree. non-human creatures to talk about the Ninevites. The Ninevites, the Assyrians, and then we got to the sailors. We did not finish the sailors, um, but just to jump back into the sailors, uh, let's recap on what the sailor, the significance of the sailors were. Before we do that, let's pray a little bit, uh, and then we'll jump into it. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all your good gifts. We ask that you bless us with wisdom and prepare us in this hour for worship. Remind us that you are working not only here, but throughout the world. And remember our brothers and sisters who are not with us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, I also... Uh, we need to pass around the offering. It's already started. Yes. So let's pass so it around. We'll pass it from table to table. I'll come back and pick it up. Okay. Craig will take it up. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so just to recap the story, we know Jonah runs away from God. He's been told to go to the Assyrians and the Ninevites, preach this message of repentance so that they could turn back toward God. He doesn't do that. He gets on a boat with these sailors and they eventually throw him overboard. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about these sailors. What do you remember about these sailors? They each prayed to their own God. They prayed to their own God. So they, these sailors are not Israelite sailors. They are Gentile sailors. Uh, they, they at least worship other gods. What else? Were they eager to throw John overboard? They did not want to throw him overboard. They did not want to throw him overboard. We, we talked about in the rabbinic tradition how the story goes that they dipped him in by his feet and they dipped him up to his knees and they dipped him up his waist to, to elucidate or make an example of how reluctant they were to throw him overboard. In fact, in the text it says they tried to sail toward shore. They tried to throw all their other cargo overboard before they have to throw Jonah overboard. What else? Anything else about the sailors? We talked a little bit about how the sailors were, I think this is where we stopped, righteous Gentiles. In the Jewish tradition, there's a notion that there are righteous Gentiles. There are people who are non-Israelites who act faithfully. So there are people who are not God's people who nonetheless display characteristics of God's people. And in the case of Jonah, they are way more faithful than the Israelite who has abandoned his mission to go to the Gentiles. So you have these sailors who are, who are trying to preserve Jonah's life, who, 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 who are honoring him and reluctant to kill him, and then you have Jonah who could care less about these Assyrians, these Ninevites. So you see this odd contrast between the unfaithful Israelite and the righteous Gentile. What are examples of righteous Gentiles? We have Rahab, if you remember the spy, coming to the land. Rahab saves him. We also have Naomi. We also have the widow of Zarephath. There are several examples in the Bible of righteous people who are not God's people. 
This uh, Isaiah 56 is sort of the text for this. It says also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath holds fast my covenant. Even then I will bring my holy mount. So the idea is God chooses people. Presbyterians love that. God chooses people. But throughout the Bible we also see that in God's grace, there are people who God doesn't choose that somehow get in on God's covenant. Okay? And those would be the righteous Gentiles. Eventually, by the time we get to the New Testament, all kinds of Gentiles can get in on the covenant. Uh, in the Jewish tradition today, uh, they have this award that was given out after World War II. The, the nation state of Israel, after it was founded, they give out an award uh, the righteous among the Gentiles. Right? They, and this is for people who saved Jews during the Holocaust. So even in Judaism today, there is this notion that there are righteous people who are not Jewish. So if you are in the New Testament times before Christ came, or right around the time of Christ, Jews would recognize this idea that there are Gentiles who could be righteous. Uh, and how would a Gentile become a Jew in New Testament times? Well, here, here's an example. Or here's how they would do it. So conversion to Judaism before the time of Christ, you needed three things. One is you had to believe in only one God. You had to get circumcised if you were a male. Sorry, males. And if you were, you'd also get baptized. And if you're a woman, you would get baptized. But then you have to be integrated into the Jewish community. And part of that would be making a sacrifice. Uh, so the people who weren't circumcised, so you can imagine that there were people in Jesus' day, or right before Jesus, who did not want to be circumcised, but nonetheless they still believed in one God, the Jewish God. And these people were called God-fearers. It's sort of a technical term that you will see throughout the book of Acts. So those who fear God. So by the time you get to the book of Acts, here's some examples in Acts 13. It talks about brothers and sisters, you, you descendants of Abraham's family, and others who fear God. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, and the word worshiper there actually is the word God-fearer. To fear God and to worship God is the same in the Greek and Hebrew. And then again in Acts 17 it says, So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons also in the marketplace. And then it goes on to talk about this man named Cornelius. So let me just let me slow down for a second. Anybody want me to slow down for a second? Uh, what I'm trying to show you is that in the Old and in the New Testament, there's always people outside of God's covenant who somehow get brought into God's covenant. So that teaches us that being a part of God's family is not based on blood or ethnicity. It's based on faith and fearing the one true God. In the Old Testament, the sailors are the perfect example of people who don't know God, who aren't even on their way to know God, and yet meet someone like Jonah, and they become righteous. Now, in the New Testament, there is not a clear division between Jews and Gentiles. There's actually this group of people in between called God-fearers. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. And one of the best examples of this in the book of Acts is a man about a man named Cornelius. Does anyone recall the story of Cornelius? David? I do recall it. You do recall it. <laughs> In light of you recalling it, would you like to read it? Yeah, I'll read it. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius. 
And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, who is called Peter. Now, what's interesting, let's, let's look at Cornelius with the story. It says that he was a devout man, one that feared God. That's that technical term. This isn't just sort of a, he was afraid of God. This is a technical term that means he is someone who is Gentile, but yet he is interested and he is worshiping the Jewish God. Now, what makes that even really interesting is what is this man's occupation? Tell me, yes. Tell, tell me about that. What does that mean? In charge of a hundred men. Charge of a hundred men. What, uh, and and what empire is he working for? Roman. The Roman Empire. And what do we know about the relationship between the Roman Empire and Israel at this time? They were oppressed. They were dominated. They were controlled. So imagine, imagine this man's position. He's working for the Roman Empire. Literally, his job is to keep Roman order over the Jewish population. But his religion, so to speak, who is he worshiping? The Jewish God. He's in an odd position. He's a God-fearer. He hasn't gotten circumcised. But he does believe in the Jewish God. And then, at the same time, he's kind of like those sailors in the Old Testament. He's from a different land. He has, you know, he, he, he's, and, and more than the sailors, not only that, he's essentially like the Assyrians, the Ninevites, to Israel. He's an occupier. He's someone that Jewish people ought to hate. Now, he has a vision and a man named Simon, who's called Peter. And does anyone know what Peter's uh, surname is, so to speak? Son of Simon, a uh, man named Peter, uh, also called, oh, called Simon, also called Peter, son of Jonah. Jesus calls him Bar Jonah, right? Uh, in one of the Gospels. So this is just one of those random tangents I want to throw at you. Is in Jonah, in the Jonah story, you have the story of a prophet, God's prophet, going to a righteous Gentile, basically bringing him to faith. Here in the book of Acts, you have a righteous Gentile, a God-fearer, Cornelius, who's working for the empire, who's met by Simon, Peter, or Jonah. Peter, we know, is usually reluctant. He was also reluctant, if you remember, to go to him. And where is Simon, or where is Cornelius in this story? Well, where, notice the last line. He's not there, but what city is this in? The last sentence. Joppa. Joppa. Where do we see Joppa before? Jonah. Jonah. So it's just a, some interesting little nuggets and parallels between the story of Jonah and the story of Cornelius and his conversion. So. And Peter was a fisherman. And Peter was a fisherman, too. Yes. There's all sorts of overlap. Let's jump back to the sailors. It, uh, it ends by saying the men feared the Lord even more and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So what the author of the book of Jonah might be doing is saying that you know Jonah, who didn't want any of the Gentiles to convert, who is a reluctant prophet, he actually ends up coming to these Gentiles on a boat, and what do they do? They essentially convert. They fear the Lord, they offer a sacrifice, and they make vows. So, it's not often that we accidentally convert people to Jesus, right? But I want you to uh, just break up in your in your tables, uh, and I want you to think uh, about this idea of a righteous Gentile. What we've seen in the Old Testament and the New Testament is that there are people out there who don't know the faith, and yet somehow, when they come across 
God's people, they convert. Is it possible that there are righteous Gentiles or Christians? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Talk to the people at your table. Do you think there is a case to be made that there are righteous Gentiles or righteous non-believers outside of the Christian faith? Talk to your tables. Okay, and it's okay if you didn't figure it all out in two minutes. Uh, but yeah, so you've talked about how we have to have faith. Christians believe we have to have faith in Christ to be justified, to be made righteous. And yet, at the same time, there does seem to be the sense that other people can act righteously. We can still, in our everyday, ordinary speech, say, this person acted rightly or wrongly. What, any, any insights over here? English himself. Uh, he's already a God fearing man. And what led him to be 
earn, as it were, for this vision? Uh, was it out of the blue? Was it something that he was led to? So I, you know, I can see that at work in a lot of situations. Do you agree with that? Yeah, just that I, the, the fact that, that God is at work in non-Christians and non-Jews, and that, that there's a certain, uh, I would read the Bible saying it's written in the heart, that, there's, that God is at work in us people. I read the book of Romans if, over there. Well, Romans, if the, that verse that I got my go-to is um, um, people who are without the law, there's a law unto themselves, and their conscience either accuses them or excuses them. And the God Paul, judges the yeah. secrets of the through Christ. Right there, Paul might be appealing to this tradition of the righteous Gentile. Right. So that might be actual, actual, some evidence of, of that belief. My question was, do you think people will keep it quiet? Mm. Will they not tell you that they have converted? Romans has something to say about that too. Romans 10. Uh, what do you think over here? <laughs> well, we came up with the idea that there's people who have strong moral and ethical standards that don't necessarily embrace a religion. Right. That is true. Since we are all born Gentiles, when we come into this earth, we are the same as the Gentiles. We don't know right from wrong. We don't know anything. So where does that righteousness in us come from? And how does it evolve? The only answer that I have is that the Holy Ghost is in all of us. And God said that he would write it on our hearts so far as it is in us. And C.S. Lewis says that every society known by anthropologists from the Inuits to the Aborigines, they all got the same set of rules as far as those Ten Commandments. And they might differ on mixing fibers and eating shellfish, but when it comes to being good people, that's, that's something every human being knows. For every animal seems to run off instinct, personal survival. Humans have some kind of laws that we all know about. What about back there? Any, any commentary from the nose bleeds? Uh, we had to say thing. Define what righteous is or good is. Um, and we, we got to a few things. Selfless, doing things for others, be nice. So, you know, this, oh, this question opens up the door to a whole lot of questions. Uh, and the, the, the answer, there's no clear-cut answer on this. What it seems, what the New Testament seems to be clear on is, one, you cannot earn your way into heaven. You can't do X amount of good things and say, okay, I deserve to get in, right? So, us, we Protestants want to say you are saved by grace, you're made righteous by God's grace by Jesus' death and resurrection. If we could be righteous on our own, Jesus would never have needed to die and rise again. On the other hand, we also see these examples in Scripture of people acting righteously. Uh, one way that I can begin to make sense of this 
is that there might be a difference between people who are insisting that they are owed something by their good works and people who do good works because they feel like that's what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, so there's a difference in saying, hey, God, you owe me heaven because I'm doing good works and, and, and just doing good works because that's who you are. Uh, it's really interesting if you think about Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, it says that Jesus judges the nations. And by the way, Matthew 25, the way we typically read it, we've got it, I think, completely wrong. But in Matthew 25, it's that famous passage where Jesus says, um, he divides the goats from the sheep, and he says, if you have uh, fed me or clothed me or, or uh, done this, then you can come into the kingdom. And they say, when do we do this, Lord? And he says, whenever you did it for the least of these. You're all familiar with that passage. And usually we hear that passage and we say, oh, we better do well to the poor and the needy and the stranger. Otherwise, we'll be judged. That is Christ. That's not quite actually how we should read that. That passage says that Jesus will judge the nations. And then when he does judge the nations, he'll say to the Gentile, nation and Gentile are the same word in Hebrew, goyim. He will say to them, you get to come into the kingdom of God. And they'll say, how, Lord? And he'll say, because whatever you did, the least of these, you did to me. It's almost as if they acted righteously and they didn't even know it. Right? He goes on to say, if you give a cup of cold water to the least of these, you will be rewarded. But they didn't know it. So that's different than saying, I'm going to do good things so I can climb the ladder to heaven. In this example, Jesus says, hey, guess what? You're saved and you didn't even know it. And that gets back to this definition of righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, in many cases, it's to be hospitable to the stranger. To be hospitable. Think about a lot goes into Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happens? Abraham says, if there's just a couple righteous people who are willing to take these angels in, then I'll save the whole city. Right? Jesus sends his people out, town to town, and if they receive him, then those houses are saved. And they receive his disciples are saved. God sends Jonah to Nineveh, and if they receive him and his message, what happens? God averts his wrath. So sometimes righteousness is connected with this idea of receiving welcome. Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. So it might be the case, I know all of us worry. All of us who are sincerely worried about what happens to people who don't hear the gospel. Right? Gideon brought this up. What about people in the jungles in the middle of nowhere who never get to hear? Do they just automatically go to hell? We can't say that. What we can say is that God is going to surprise us and surprise people with grace. And they won't even know. Right? So we have to be very careful about how we deal with this issue. There is a possibility of, I think, the righteous Gentile. That's a longer uh, example. And we've gotten away from Jonah. And I told you guys that I was going to do tangents. So... We have time to jump into the character of Jonah. What time do we have? Okay, yeah, we got we got ten minutes. Let's start the character of Jonah. So in the biblical tradition, there's really two passages about Jonah. Jonah, Jonah, obviously, Jonah 118. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. So we have a kind of short introduction of Jonah in the book of Jonah. And then in 2 Kings chapter 14, we have this. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became, became king in Samaria. I should ask somebody else for him. Uh, and he reigned 41 years. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebanon, uh, Hamath, to the Dead Sea, in accordance with the word of the Lord. The God of Israel spoke to the servant, son of Jonah, Amittai, the prophet from Gath. Heifer. So we get a little bit of biography about Jonah in 2 Kings. He is the prophet from Gath Heifer. Where is Gath Heifer? 
Well, you can see this is Nazareth, where the Lord Jesus is from. I told you last week, Gath and Nazareth, Heifer's right above it. I told you last week that uh, Israel got split in two after essentially Solomon and his sons reigned. There was the northern Israel and there was Judah. Right? And then what happens in 722? The Ninevites come in and they decimate northern Israel. The ten tribes are scattered to the winds and now you just have the kingdom of Judah where we get the word Jewish. Right? So we talk about the ten lost tribes if any of you have seen Indiana Jones. Right? Judah, Jonah is actually from the north. He is from one of the northern tribes. And so Gath Hefer is in the nor northern kingdom and it's probably associated with Zebulun, the tribe of Zebulun. So why does Jonah probably hate the Assyrians? Because his, his world was turned upside down. Yeah, the, the Assyrians annihilated his people. Right? They came in, they decimated and scattered to the winds his tribe and his, his people. In the rabbinic tradition, Jonah is actually associated with the widow from Zarephath. So do you, do you remember the story of Elijah? He goes into Gentile territory near Sidon, and he comes across a widow who's trying to feed. She's running, she, there's a famine in the land because of a drought, and she needs to feed her son and herself. And Elijah says, feed me too. Give me a drink of water, feed me. And she says, I can't. I only have enough for me and my son. And she eventually has faith, takes him in. She's hospitable. You see that righteous hospitality to a, uh, a Gentile giving righteous hospitality to a, uh, to a Jew or to a believer. And then... Um, Miraculously, they keep having an abundant supply of food. Right? It's kind of like daily manna. It comes out of nowhere. It sustains her and her son and the prophet. But then one day her son dies. And Elisha has to go upstairs and he breathes over him and the son is resuscitated. Are you from, this story is starting to sound familiar. Well, the rabbinic tradition said, actually, that wasn't a Gentile family. That was a Jewish family who lived in diaspora. They lived in the north. And that that son was Jonah. I don't know how to get that. But the point is, um, there is this, this linkage between that child and Jonah. One of the reasons why the rabbis might be unwilling to say that that family was uh, a Gentile, is, is, or they wanted to say that that family was Jonah's family, is because they might have been unwilling to say that a Gentile would act so righteously. So if they're acting like that, they must be one of our own, right? And so um, it's just an interesting little uh, rabbinic nugget. Now let's look at Jonah as a, as a symbol. Son of Amittai literally means dove, son of truth. So Amittai means truth or faithfulness. Jonah, the word Jonah means dove. I want you to think about the irony of that name. So, throughout the whole story, Jonah's trying to fly, right? He's trying to fly from the Lord, but he can't get away from the Lord. So, dove, son of truth. And interesting, at the end of the book of Jonah, he knows the truth. God, the reason why I flew away from you is because I knew you were righteous and merciful. And I knew you were slow to anger and gracious. And that's exactly why I ran away. There might be a kind of play with his name there. Dove also is usually the symbol in Scripture of universal peace. So you think about the Noah story. The Noah story, the dove comes back with the twig as a sign that the wrath of God, the flood is over, the dry land has appeared. In the Noah story, I mean in the, in the baptism of Jesus story, the dove comes down like the Holy Spirit to land on Jesus to show that he is the beloved of God. This is also ironic because do you think Jonah wants peace with the Assyrians, the Ninevites? No, he doesn't. Dove can also be term, a term of endearment. So men out there, you can use that. Your, your wife, your dove. Uh, you might think about it like honey bun, uh, 
Sweetie pie. I don't know what you use at home, but dove is often used in the scripture as a, as a term of endearment toward one's lover. If you have eyes like a dove, you can recall the song of Solomon. Uh, so if you're looking for any good pickup lines, uh, there's scriptures for that too. And then in the Bible and in later rabbinic tradition, Judaism in, in rabbinic Judaism, the dove is associated with Israel itself. So Hosea 7, Israel is like a dove, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is again, and the commentary talks about Israel as a dove. And sometimes dove means, sometimes doves are uh, associated with foolishness because doves are not thought to be very bright. Uh, yeah. So when Israel does something foolish, you can see the language used of their dove-like behavior. And in that case, it would certainly fit Jonah. All right. Um, we're at 1040, 42, so I think I'm going to stop there. But um, my kind of point is Jonah can be thought not just as a person, but he can also be thought of as a symbol of the church. Of this person called by God to share a message of repentance to the non-Gentile or the non-Jew. And what does he do? He doesn't want to do that. He runs, he tries to fly away. The other irony with his name is, um, is that he's called a dove. And we know that everyone, every, every other aspect, the sailors, the Ninevites, who are associated with lions, storm, the sea, the wind, all other aspects of creation are in alignment with God's will. But it's the dove, Jonah, who does not want to follow God's will. Okay. We'll talk next week about, well not next week, next week I will not be here. So we will not have Sunday school next week. Uh, but we will meet again one more final time. Um, the week after, and we will talk about where is Jesus Christ and the Lord God in the book of John. Any thoughts, any questions before we close out? We're still doing breakfast? Yeah, we, we'll still have breakfast next week. So in that time, do we go to our regular class? We, uh, no, we will not. We just no. Um, but, but hang out, uh, talk more, um, think about the book of John. Mm -hmm. Any, any questions? Unless, Lindsay, you want to bring in devotion. Uh, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the book of Jonah. We pray that we will see uh, in the book of Jonah your gracious hand. We, we pray that we see in the book of Jonah the mission to share the good news. And we pray that we see in the book of Jonah that that the world is bigger than us and that there are people outside of the church who are doing your will and that we are called to, to be open to that. We ask that you bless us and keep us now and prepare our hearts for worship. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Go in peace.